section is on the forgetfulness, which uh, Maddox method is a little more complicated than uh, the other methods do one or the other. Imam Maddox has, he differentiates between omission and commission in the prayer, what's called a uh, ziada or a nuqsan. So if you, if you do something, you committed something that you shouldn't have done or you omitted something that, that you should have done, it's going to change the ruling. Um, the the om the omission missing out something is worse than commission generally. So sahu uh, is is uh, means forgetfulness in Arabic sahayasu sahwan to forget something. The uh, the Prophet uh, forgot once in a prayer. I mean the ulama say that the Prophet the things that he does generally are for teaching so he did s certain things if Allah caused him to forget it was it was for the teaching uh, point of the of the uh, of the prayer but he did uh, forget and and uh, one of the Sahaba asked him did the ruling change you know in other words are is there only three rakats instead of four and then the Prophet ﷺ asked others if they, and then he uh, he corrected it and then did his uh, sujood for the sahu. So this is uh, from the sunnah. And the uh, sahu means to forget something without, you know, that, that you genuinely forgot it. It wasn't something that you, uh, that you were aware of. If things are done intentionally, it can change the ruling. Um, but... Uh, it's mentioned in the Quran, الَّذِينَ هُمْ عَنْ صَرَاتِهِمْ سَاهُونَ When, when Allah um, censures those who uh, are neglectful of their prayers, meaning they, they delay the times, they don't really, uh, aren't concerned about the times. So the, um, the, 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 uh, the sajda to sahu, which is two sajda after uh, the tashahud al-akhir, so when you finish the tashahud, uh, you either do it before the salam or after the salam. So if it's before the salam, it's called a qabli. Qabli, which means in Arabic, before. And if it's after the salam, it's called a ba'di, which means in Arabic, after. So the uh, you're doing it to redress whatever uh, wrongs that you have, uh, you know, whatever you've done in in the prayer and so it has the niyyah you know that you're actually redressing it so you have the intention to redress it and then it has the uh, the sajdat al-ula and then the the sitting between the two and then the sajdat al thaniya and then the salam getting out of the prayer and uh, the tashahud can be repeated but it's getting out of the prayer so those are the obligations and then the sunan are to do the takbir and the tashahud you do not, if you forget something in your prayer, uh, in the sahu, there's no sahu for sahu. So you don't, you know, and some people have problems. You know, unfortunately, there's people that are called mustankih uh, or muwaswis. Mustankih is shak, is somebody who almost every prayer they have problems. They can't remember how many rakats they pray, they can't remember if they did this, they can't remember. People that are preoccupied, uh, people that are under a lot of stress. Uh, there's different reasons why people do that and some people have obsessive compulsive disorder which Imam Ahmed Zarruq actually identified waswasa as he said it's either ignorance of the sunnah or it's a psychological disorder so it's something that people recognize earlier um, but if you do have that then the ruling is you you, you know that it has a different ruling he, he'll he'll get to that so um, the prostration of forgetfulness is either a qabli or a ba'di, and it's performed before the, uh, the, the qabli is performed before the exit salam. It's performed for forgetting or omitting a stress sunnah, right? So it is not performed for leaving out recommended acts or obligatory acts. So the method of performance after completing the final tashahud of the prayer, like salawat on the Prophet ﷺ making dua and before saying the exit salam. Perform two prostrations beginning with Allahu Akbar. After completing both prostrations, you recite the tashahud 
ending with ashhadu an la ilaha illallah wa ashhadu anna muhammadan abduhu wa rasuluhu and then the final salam to exit and then the rules for performing a qabli if one performs qabli intentionally for leaving out uh, one stress sunnah the prayer is rendered uh, invalid if one uh, owes a qabli um, so the in other words if you look at the the stress sunan the eighth stress sunan like the uh, the 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 sir uh, and the and the jahar and the and the the sitting the tashahud the tashahud has the sitting and the tashahud most of these stress sunan have more than one uh, with it so you don't confuse the two right in other words uh, the the uh, the sahu is for uh, two or more stress sunan, but in each one of the stress sunan are generally two sunan. So that's what's happened. So if you if you do it for uh, you know for for one of the stress sunan, then the prayer is invalid. If one owed a qabli and forgot to perform it before the salam, the following applies. If one remembers shortly after exiting the prayer, one needs to make it up by performing a badi. So uh, if you owed a qabli and forgot to perform it before the salam, then if you if you uh, remember it shortly after exiting the prayer, you do the badi. And then if one remembers after a long period of time or after leaving the masjid, then the following applies. If it was due to two stress sunan, then one need not make it up and the prayer is valid. If it was due to three or more stress sunan, then the prayer is invalid and you have to make it up. So if you miss two tr- stress sunan, and, and you didn't, you forgot to do it, and you leave for the qabli, then the prayer is valid. But if it was three or more, it's invalid. All right. So that's the uh, that's the qabli, and then the badi is the prostration of forgetfulness performed after the exit salam. It is performed when one forgetfully adds certain acts during the prayer. So the method of performance after completing the prayer and exiting by saying assalamu alaikum. Perform two prostrations beginning with Allahu Akbar. After completing both prostrations, you recite the tashahud ending with Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah wa Ashhadu Muhammad Rasulullah and then you exit with the final salam. So if one uh, forgot to perform the badi, then upon remembering, one makes it up regardless of the amount of time. So Ibn Ashur says, وَاسْتَدْرَكَ الْبَعْدِ وَلَوْ مِنْ بَعْدِ عَام You make up the, uh, the badi even if it's after a year. So you, you know, a year later, you're sitting in your room, you remember, I didn't do that. In the prayer, you do the... So the ba'di, you do it uh, any time. And then also, there's no prostration of forgetfulness uh, is required for the following uh, acts. Leaving out a virtuous act, leaving out a recommended act, leaving out a sunnah that is not stressed, sending salutation upon the Prophet upon hearing his name mentioned, uh, fixing the ba- prayer barrier, the sutra, as long as there's not too much movement. Walking the distance of three prayer rows. So if you walk, uh, which, you know, I mean, from it's permissible to go in front, right? Of, if, if, if a space opens up, you go in front, you go in front like that. If it, if it becomes too much, then it's too much movement. Fixing one's prayer shawl without too much movement. Yawning or covering the mouth. You cover the mouth like that if you yawn in the prayer. Um, clearing the throat. Doing tasbih to alert the imam of an error he made like subhan, subhanallah if the imam or the women clap if the imam makes a mistake. Uh, and then doing uh, shifting one's weight from one foot to the other. None of these affect your prayer. Motioning with one's head or hand to return salam. Most of the ulama say that you, the salam is wajib to return. So if somebody says, Salaamu Alaikum, and you're praying, you just uh, motion with your hand. You don't, you don't give them a salam, but you motion with your hand. Uh, crackling one, one's knuckles is makru to do that, but it doesn't break it. Swallowing morsels, a morsel of food. If it's a small amount, uh, that just a, like a, something that was in your mouth and you swallow it, it doesn't... Uh, and also scratching lightly, reciting the qunut supplication audibly instead of silently, none of those affect them. Uh, now in terms of redressing a pillar, the the arkan of the prayer, which are the fara'id that were mentioned, 
you have to redress those because the 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 sujud the seho does not uh, fix those. So if you if you don't uh, redress those, then the prayer is invalid. So leaving out a pillar must be redressed. No prostration of forgetfulness can suffice for it. Even though once you redress it, you still do the seho, but you have to redress it. Unlike the sunan. So for instance, if you go, if you're in the the uh, second, the first rakat, you're in the second sajda, you're in the second rakat, second sajda, and instead of sitting, you go up. You've left out the julus and the tashahud, two sunan mu'akkada. So now you owe a uh, a, a seho. Which one? A publi, right? Because you you you've you've omitted. Now, if you did something like um, you recited out loud the the the, the fatiha uh, in um, you know it, where it should have been a sir then that's a commission, right? And then if you sat, for instance, uh, in the s- first rakat, you did the julus and you did the tashahud, then you realize, then that's a commission. So that's a ba'di. You go up and you just continue on with your prayer. Mm-hmm. The ma'moon, nothing is going to affect as long as you don't do anything completely insane. The, the imam takes all of your uh, uh, commissions and omissions. Unless it happened after his salam and then you are doing a rakat and you make a mistake in that rakat, then, then you redress it. But the imam takes your... Uh, pra- That's why the imam's role is so important because the imam is carrying the prayers of the, of the congregation. The Prophet ﷺ said to put forward, he said one of the signs of the end of time is people will put imams with good voices. You know, that, that, that he said they won't have fiqh, they'll just be people that have good voices. And, and uh, so you, you want good people to lead your prayer because they're carrying your prayer. Uh-huh. And then obviously they're going to be giving wrong things. Then you sit down with them. Yeah. See, look, if you come in with the... I mean, this this is the most complicated section in prayer. And it's kind of... I don't know if it's designed to just keep people really present. In the, I mean, it seems like Madik is just like, you better be present in your prayer because if you mess these up, you're going to really be in trouble. Do you know, it's almost like he's kind of saying that. It's like it's 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 worth paying attention in your prayer. So if you come in and the imam is in the uh, the first rakat, the second rakat, and you and you so this is your first rakat. You go down with him, and then he sits. You sit with him, but now you're going to owe a rakat. So when he says his salam, you get up and you finish the rakat. You build on whatever it is. Now the only thing about, sometimes you can end up doing three julus. All right, with the, because you have to do a julus for the, the second rakat and then the third and the fourth. So you'll end up doing three julus in some situations if you come in late with the imam. All right. What's that? Because you did a julus, and then in the second rakat you do another julus. And then you do a, a third, third julus at the end of the prayer. So you get three julus in that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you say the tahiyyah with the imam. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh-huh. Um, if you read the rakat with the imam, then you sit in the final rakat with the imam. Uh-huh. Yeah, no, you wait. You do the tashahud, you do the salat al Ibrahimi at the end of your prayer. You you act as if that's your second one. It doesn't it doesn't affect it. Yeah, it doesn't affect it. No. And the basic rule of thumb is that Alright. That's one way to remember it. The um So, uh huh. 
We'll get, yeah, that's, that's under congregational prayer. You know, it's the, it's the rules related to congregational prayer. Uh-huh. Right. The light sunan are are you know there's only eight stress sunan, right? The uh, the the sir and the jahar, the the julus, uh, the tashahud, right? And the uh, two or more the takbir that you have to do, and then. Uh, so any of those that you miss out, right? You have you, you, you do a seho for, right? But if it's like uh, the light sunan, like a if you if you have two takbir, right? Or if you have uh, I'm gonna go over all these. Okay, so so I'll go over them because because I, I I need I want let me get through this section and then I'll go over uh -huh. say that again Fatiha has a rukan so you have to redress the Fatiha no if you miss it in any one raka yeah so, for instance, if you if you went down into the rukuah, you'd have to go back up and do the fatiha again, like that, and then you would owe uh, you would owe a, a sahu for that. No, you'd go. You have to do. If you forgot, you'd go back up, do recite. If it depends on where you are. If you're still in the rukua, hold on. Leaving out a so a pillar must be redressed. No prostration forgetfulness can suffice for it. Redress a rukua before bowing in the following rakah. All right. So redress a sajda before rising from the bowing position in the following rakah. Redress al fatiha before rising from rukua. If you've risen from rukua, then you have to do. Uh, you do a uh, a rakat at the end, right? Huh, Uzma? You do a rakat at the end, and then you do the the uh, the seho. So for sajda, for one missed prostration, if one had not sat, return to the sitting position, and then make up the missed prostration, continue on. If one had sat, go directly into prostration, and continue on. For missing both prostrations, go directly into prostration and continue on. In all these cases, a ba'di is owed for the extra actions performed. So if one missed the chance to redress the pillar, then the rakat that contains the missed pillar is voided. And then the one that follows takes its place. A ba'di is owed unless the rakat that was voided contained a surah, and the rakat that replaced it is without a surah. In that case, a qabli is owed. In the case of leaving out al-fatiha, if one missed the chance to redress it, Finish the prayer, perform a qabli, and repeat the prayer with the intention that, is, uh, uh, that it is obligatory to repeat it, regardless of whether the time is still in or not. So you'd, you'd redress it and then make up the prayer like that. So this, now I'm going to go through the, uh, the actions of the prayer related to al-Fatiha. All right. So, if you leave out the Fatiha, you complete the prayer and do a Qabli and then make up the prayer. Recite an extra Fatiha unintentionally, then you do a Ba'di because you've done a commission. Repeated Al-Fatiha to redress a mistake, you do a Ba'di. So, if you made a mistake in the in the, uh, like you recited the Fatiha silently in an audible rakat, uh, then, then you repeat it again and then you do a ba'di because of the commission. 
recited three verses or more of Fatiha silently in an audible rak'ah, you do a qabli. Recited three verses or more of Fatiha audibly in a silent rak'ah, you do a ba'di. So th those are related to the Fatiha. In the surah, if you left out the surah, then you do a qabli. If you left out, uh, if, if you recited the surah before Al-Fatiha and did not repeat it after, then you do a qabli. So you recited the surah before Al-Fatiha and did not repeat it after Al-Fatiha, then you do the qabli. Recited the surah before Al-Fatiha and repeated it after, then there's nothing owed. Recited the surah silently in two rak'at in an audible prayer, you do a qabli. Recited three verses or more of the surah audibly in a silent prayer, you do a ba'di. Recited multiple surahs in a raka'ah, nothing owed. Recited a portion of a surah, nothing owed. So even though in Malik's madhab, it's uh, mandub to recite the surah completely. If you don't, it's not, there's nothing owed, it's acceptable. And then started one surah and moved to another before completing the first, nothing owed. Also the order of the surah is the same. It's, it's mandub to follow the order of the Qur'an, but if you don't, it's, it doesn't affect you. So those are, um, the, the, those are the, the it's related to the surah. And then the takbir and the tahmid. So the takbir is saying Allahu Akbar, the tahmid is saying Allahu Diman Hamida. If you left out two or more takbira, then you owe a qabli. Left out two or more sami Allahu liman hamida, you owe a qabli. Left out a combination of takbira and tahmida, you owe a qabli. Left out only one takbira, right, then you owe nothing owed. Left out only one tahmida, nothing owed. All right. Now on the tashahud, if you leave out the tashahud, uh, you remembered it after both knees and hands have left the ground and didn't return to it, then you owe a qabli. So once you go up off the ground, you've omitted doing your tashahud and uh, you have the julus and the saying the tashahud so, and sitting for it. So all, all the, those, those are all you're redressing those. Remembered it before completing Al-Fatiha and went ba back down to repeat it. So in that case, you owe a Ba'di, right? Because you shouldn't have, uh, now you've done, you've done exce uh, excessive movement. Did everybody follow that? In other words, uh, you know, we should make uh, maybe copies for these, huh? And give them. I think that'd be easier because th this just—it's a complicated uh, chapter. I mean, to make it you know as simple as possible, the you know what what you have to keep in mind is that it's either excess or uh, you know you're either committing something or you're omitting something. If it's committing something, then you you, you owe the badi. If it's omitting something, if you've forgotten something, you owe a qabli. That's the basic rule. And, but then you have to know the stress sunan. All right, you have to know the, the, the eight stress sunan because that's going to relate what, what you owe or two or more of the light sunan. If it gets, uh, you know, if it gets where you, you've, you've, uh, you're in shak, then you do the, uh, the qabli, right? So if, 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 you're, if, if you think uh, you, you owe a ba'di and a qabli, then the the uh, the qabli overwhelms the ba'di and if you do make a mistake because sometimes you'll do this you'll do a a qabli or a ba'di and the, it it serves as the saho so even if you make a mistake in your saho you did the saho as long as you did the saho whether it was before or after the prayer is valid so don't don't get obsessed about you know if you can't remember just do the do the uh, so uh, and then the raka'at unintentionally added an extra raka'at. So this is related to the raka'ats. Then you owe 
uh, you owe a, uh, a ba'di, so if you added an extra rakat, like if you went up for a fifth rakat and then you realized, then you add, you've done, you've done uh, omission, commission, so you add a ba'di at the end of that. Now, what's important to remember is if you know the imam's wrong, on a fifth rakat, don't go up with him. Because if you do go up with him, your prayer is invalid. So, so if you're certain the imam has done four rakats, or three in maghrib, or two in fajr, and he goes up for a third, don't go up with him. Wait until he comes back down. I mean, you say, subhanallah, you call his attention, and wait till he comes back down. And then finish the prayer with him. Like that. And then you do the seho with him. But don't follow him in, in that. Which is a good point about, one of the things about prayer is it teaches you not to follow blindly. You know, that you, you, you maintain your own, even if the, if the imam's wrong and you know he's wrong, you don't follow him. What's that? In a, in a rukan. Yeah. Yeah, you do it with him because he made the mistake and you're you're in his prayer. Yeah. Uh-huh. There's a salam after it. Yeah, there's a second salam. So you do two salams. Yeah. If you do a ba'di, you do a second salam to get out of the prayer. And then, uh, in, so in the rakat, uh, if you intentionally added a rakat, then it's, it nullifies the prayer. You have to make up the prayer. If you unintentionally doubled up the number of rakats, then y y again, you have to uh, redo your prayer. If you intentionally left out a rakat, again, the prayer is invalid. If you doubted the number of rakat, then built on certainty and and complete rakats there was doubt about, then you do a badi. So always, this is the rule, you always build on what you're certain. So if, you, if you've prayed, uh, if, if, if you're in a rakat and then you think, did I pray three or four? You build on three. And then you do the, 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 the badi. All right? Because what you might have done is an extra rakat. But you always build on what you're certain. Yubna al al So if you, if, you, uh, if you ever have doubt, you just look at what you're certain about. And you base the, uh, the redressing on your certainty. So in the ruku'ah, uh, forgetfully added ruku'ah, you do a ba'di. Uh, intentionally added a ruku'ah, it ruins the prayer. Sajda, if you forgetfully added a sajda, you do a ba'di. The obligatory prayer, uh, if you intentionally added it, it nullifies it. And then the final salam, if you if doubted performing the exit salam and an intermediate period of time passed or moved out of one's place without turning one's back to the qibla, then sit down, repeat the tashahud and the final salam and you do a ba'di. So if you're there and you realize I didn't exit from the prayer and it's not that long of a time, you know, it's a moderate amount, and you haven't turned away from the qibla, then you just do it, and you do your, um, you do your, uh, the prayer. If you doubt performing the exit salam, and a long time has passed, then you have to re repeat the prayer. All right? And doubted performing the exit salam, short time has passed, was still sitting in one's place, then performs the salam, then there's nothing on you, if it's a short time. Unintentionally performing the salam before completing the necessary number of rakats, then perform takbir and complete the misrakat, then you owe a ba'di. So unintentionally performing the salam before completing the necessary number of rakats, then perform takbir and complete the misrakat, you do the ba'di. Intentionally performing the salam while doubting completing the prayer, then you make up the prayer. Uh, correcting a Quran reciter other than your Imam, you owe, you have to make up the prayer because you can't talk in, in the prayer unless it's to correct your own Imam. 
and then speech that's not from the prayer, unintentionally spoke a few words or even one letter, you do a ba'di, because you've committed. If you unintentionally spoke a lot of words, then you make up the prayer. Uh, intentionally spoke even a letter, then you make up the prayer. And then to rectify the imam's mistakes, there's nothing owed on you. Um, if, you if you're weeping intentionally with sound, so like showing off or something, it invalidates the prayer. I mean, there are people that do things like that. Um, and then unintentionally over a worldly matter, if it is for a short amount of time with sound, you owe a badi. So you lost your job and you start weeping. Uh, if it's for a worldly matter, then uh, if it has sound, if it's just tears, it's not. But if it has sound, then you owe uh, the badi. And then un uh, unintentionally over a worldly matter, if it's for a long time, uh, with sound, then then it invalidates the prayer. And then without sound, if it is not for a long period of time, nothing. Uh, without sound for a long period of time, uh, then you should also oh, make up the prayer. And then smiling also or la laughing, qah qah breaks the prayer if you, if, if you laugh. Um, if it's smiling, uh, if you smile for a, a verse that's being recited and it's a beautiful verse and it's something that uh, brings you joy, then that's fine. But if it's over like worldly matters or things like that, you know. Yeah, that's what I mean. If it, no, if it's something brief, then it's nothing owed. But if it's if it's distracting your prayer, then that that's really what they're looking at, where 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 you're not really thinking about your prayer because the prayer is a place of heba. It's a place to be in awe of God, and it's not a place to be. It's like, you know, people don't laugh in front of a worldly king or a president. You know, so the analogy there is, you know, if if you're in the presence of Majesty, you tend to. I mean, I've been in like, you know, I've been in King Hassan's court. I've been in. Trust me, nobody laughs. <laughs> you know, I mean, nobody laughs. So that that's the metaphor. It's just it's inappropriate in the presence of, of divine majesty to, uh, to be laughing. And if you're smiling, the king's going to wonder what the hell is he smiling about, you know? <laughs> so, it's very interesting, you know, being in the... Because you really get, especially in medieval, because King Hassan's court, I mean, it's not the same as his son, but King Hassan's court was like a medieval court, very much so. You really felt this must have been what it was like you know, several hundred years ago, because it, it was very, uh, and one of the things about it is, you know, nobody ever made eye contact with him. It was very interesting. I think he would look, people would look away. You know, it's just the adab of sitting with the king. It was, it was very interesting to see that. Moroccans are funny, too, because, you know, King Hassan was... Uh, he was like this polymath, you know, he, he, he could do so many things. But if you go into any store in Morocco, if it's like a sporting goods store, <laughs> it's so funny. They'd have a picture of King Hassan playing tennis or playing golf. You know, if, if you went into the, the, the coffee or tea shop, he'd be drinking a cup of tea. <laughs> like a picture of him drinking tea. If, if you went into the, and this, I'm not joking, if you went into the... Uh, uh, to, to make a phone call, like in the, the teleboutique, he'd be on the phone, <laughs> right? So everything, if you went to the tailor's thing, they would have him being measured for a suit, a picture of him being measured for a suit. So wherever you went, they would have a picture of the king that worked for... So when I, when I was recording the burda, we went to uh, the, the studio, you know, to record the burda. And I walk in, and I'll be a son of a gun. I look up, and there's King Hassan playing the accordion. <laughs> I swear to God. And I just, I said to the Moroccan, I said, could, could King Hassan play? Was he a musician? He said, Musiqi <laughs> kabir. I said, really? He said, he was a great musician. And I said, uh, I said, that's amazing. He said, الملك عندنا لازم يتقن كل شيء وإلا ما يكون ملك. You know, he said like, 
for us Moroccans, the king has to be good at everything, or else he shouldn't be king. <laughs> yeah. And then if you went into the religious place, he'd be reciting Quran or praying Tarawih. <laughs> yeah. So also, if you say Yarhamukullah to somebody who sneezed, you owe a ba'di. Right? If you intentionally say that knowingly, then it breaks the prayer. Also replying to somebody who says that. In unintentionally blowing with the mouth, like that, doing something like that, you owe a ba'di, because it's, it's like sound. Um, but intentionally, then it's, it invalidates the prayer. Mm-hmm. No. What's that? I mean, if you do that, it's not going to, yeah, it doesn't, it doesn't harm it. And then, uh, then the laughing, again, if it has a sound, if it's called qahqaha, يُقَحْقِهُ Then it breaks the prayer. And then eating or, or drinking, if it's intentionally, then it breaks the prayer. If it's unintentionally, then it's a ba'di. If it's a small amount. And then if you fall asleep while you're praying, it invalidates the prayer. Yeah. If, if, if you have any stomach reflex and you didn't swallow it, then it, it doesn't harm the prayer. If it's vomit, then it does. As long as it hasn't changed. And then also, uh, you know, if, if somebody intentionally belches, then it invalidates the prayer. If, if they couldn't help it, then it's a badi. Uh-huh. Yeah, no, you can start over. Yeah, if, if, if you're really not, it's good to go do wudu again. Like if you're really, because sometimes people go into the prayer and they're just completely, and they realize it, then you, yeah, it's good to, uh, to do that. Um, you know, if you didn't have like any knee or anything, if you came in and you, and, and you should finish the prayer and then repeat it, just make it up again. Yeah, because it's not good to break a prayer that you've gone into if, if you're Niyya, you finish the prayer. But you can make it up. If you feel like I didn't have Khushu'a in that prayer, you can go and do Wudu and then make make the prayer up. Uh-huh. What's that? You just leave the prayer. Once you've lost wudu, yeah, you just leave the prayer. Yeah. The prayers, because that broke the prayer. Or if you remember, if you're an imam and, and, you, and, and, you, and, and you remember that you weren't in wudu or something, your prayer up to that point is valid. But if you, if you wait at all, you invalidate the prayer of the people praying behind you as well. So the imam has to uh, leave the prayer immediately and either do istikhlaf. If he doesn't think anybody there would would know the prayer, then he doesn't do the istikhra. But somebody can take over the prayer. If they know that they know the rules and the imam doesn't know that and they go out, then they can take over the prayer, but they have to make that niyyah. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Whoever did what? I don't know that hadith. I don't know that hadith. Uh huh.
Yeah, it is. Well, so. And if it's Jamaat, where you want to catch it, but you're like, if I stop here right now, I just cannot expose myself. But you know what I mean? You no, that's true. People take, you know, people take time. And I mentioned the other day, I think, about the Libyan man. Did I tell that in here? Yeah, getting the Kaaba in his mind. <laughs> you know. He, he used to always, he'd come to the prayer and everybody would say, Allahu Akbar, and then, you know, he'd wait and then, like, the imam's well into the first rakat and they'd hear him, Allahu Akbar. So finally, you know, somebody just said to him, why do you always wait to go into the takbir al ihram He said, you guys are so much better than me. It, it takes me that time to get the Kaaba in front of me. <laughs> so they made him the imam. <laughs> <laughs> So, I mean, it's definitely khushu'ah is alladheen hum fi salatihim khashi'oon. I mean, Allah says that they're people of khushu'ah in the prayer. You know, that they have khushu'ah. And khushu'ah is related to presence, you know, and it's a istish'ar, you know, it's related to really feeling uh, the divine presence, that you're in the divine presence. Because the Prophet ﷺ, the reason he said you should never go in front of a person praying is because he said, Yunaji Rabbahu. He is in intimate discourse with his Lord. Now, obviously, not everybody's in that state, but that's the ideal. And that's what you're not supposed to be breaking. Because if you pass in front of somebody, you could completely. And that's happened. I mean, I was, I was in the haram once, and I mean, I was in a complete hal in a prayer. And some guy next to me just started doing this, you know, moving around and and completely just took me away from it. So that happens. It's very real, you know. I mean, obviously some people, they don't have... You know, there's stories of Sahaba about, you know, pulling out the arrow and things, wait till he's in prayer. That's real. That is real. I mean, that is absolutely real, of people that were so present with their Lord that they did not feel their bodies. I know that's real. Mm-hmm. No, I wouldn't leave the prayer just if you, you should finish the prayer. No, unless you didn't have niya, unless, you know, there was something. Mm -hmm. Well, this is a good question because I've kind of done that before. But, like, sometimes when you join and you're kneeling in a bad place, once you pray, that actually helps you get out of the place. And then you can just, there's not even a thing of like a lot and just try to go in with that. That's true, yeah. I mean, you shouldn't leave the prayer once you go in unless you did not have a niyyah. You know, th then, then you, sh you, know, you should. But if you didn't feel like you had khushu'ah in the prayer, again, you can husn al-dhan billah. And also don't forget, part of the reason why the Prophet ﷺ said he gave us the rawatib. You know, there's there's nafida mu'akkada, like the four rakats before dhuhr and the four rakats after. That's nafida mu'akkada. It's very strong nafida. The reason that you do those is to redress the what is deficient in the prayer. So they're really, it's like a decompression chamber, you know. You, you, there's an antechamber. Yeah, exactly. So you get ready. And then you do the second as a way of redressing the, what was in there. And that's why right when you finish the prayer, the sunnah is to say astaghfirullah immediately. 
That's the first thing you do. Assalamu alaikum, astaghfirullah. Because there's always deficiency in the prayer. And the first thing people are taking into account for, according to the hadith, uh, is the salah. You know, hasibu. And, and the hadith says if there's any deficiency in their fard, the, Allah tells the angels, look into their extra prayers and take from that to, uh, you know, to, to redress the wrongs of the, uh, of the fard. So, What's that? Then you just finish wherever you were, yeah. If he left you without an imam, then you become your own imam. Your nia changes, yeah. Yeah, your nia. Because before you were mu'tam, now you're, yeah, in your head, that your prayer is your own. You shouldn't follow somebody next to you. There's, I think there's a madhab that does that. I don't know where you actually go like pray with the person next to you and follow them. I've seen people do that. I don't know if that's a, an opinion or... But that's not... You can't do that in Maliki Madhab. Because the Imam has to have... You know, he, he's le leading you, yeah. What's that? Make dua before what? Yeah, yeah. Sidi Ahmed Zarruq says, if you have a lot of waswasa, he says to do Qur'a'udu bi Rabbin Nas before you do your takbirat al-ihram. You can do whatever you want before you go into the prayer. Yeah, no, you do dua in the tahiyya after you finish. Yeah, it's good to do dua. What's that? Yeah. Throughout, yeah. Yeah, no, dua is good in the, the after you finish the salat al Ibrahimiyyah, then you, you do dua. As long as the Imam's going, then when he says salam, you go out. If you're on your own, you do it as well. Yeah, that's, you can do that. The, uh, in terms of the traveling prayers, well, let's do Jum'ah. That's the next section. Um, in terms of the uh, Jum'ah, فَصْرٌ بِمَوْطَنِ الْقُرَىٰ قَدْ فُرِيَ صَلَاةُ جُمْعَتَنِ خُطْبَةٍ ثَلَاتٍ In villages and cities, it's required to pray a congregational prayer that follows a sermon. So, for for the Malikis, you have to have a qariya, and that means there has to be a marketplace. So it's not just a collection of houses. There has to be a marketplace. If there's no marketplace, uh, then the Jumu'ah... Like here, I mean, people can pray because that's an opinion, but here, according to the Malikis, there's no Jumu'ah. You just pray the whole. Where I live with the Bedouin in Mauritania, they don't pray Jumu'ah. You know, they're resident. They don't pray Jumu'ah. They just pray... Uh, Dahur. So, because Bedouin don't pray Jum'ah. And uh, there also has to be a jami'ah. And a jami'ah is a mosque erected for Friday prayer. And this obligation is binding upon every resident without a valid excuse not to attend, who is a free male and lives within a, a parasang, right, of the masjid. So it's like uh, three miles. Uh, from 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 the masjid. So uh,
Well, yeah, it depends on uh, it depends on whether you. It's it's basically the parasang is which is uh, I think it's a it's a Hindu word actually, but the Arabs call it the farsakh. And depending upon which number you use for the Arabic mile, some use two thousand cubits. That's what my teachers used in Mauritania was two thousand cubits. A cubit is one arm's length. So the Bible uses the cubits. It talks about the cubits. It's from your elbow to the tip of your thumb. So two thousand or 3,500. Those are the two opinions. Some say it's 2,000, and that's what my teacher followed, which would mean that it's valid to pray the, uh, the traveling prayers with 30 miles of an English mile. I, or on Juma, but I'm just giving you the, the, what, what, what they measure here. So there's a difference. If that's the case, then, th then this is about, it's almost two miles, the parasang here, which w would be an obligation. So if you live within two miles, now obviously this is walking pre, uh, you know, car and things, and uh, I mean technically these, these, uh, these types of rulings don't change. So for instance, 30 miles uh, before cars was an incredible, you know, it's a, a day's journey. Now it's 30 minutes. S but the rule still applies. That, that's the way it's looked at. So anyway, that, that's what he says about the um, about the uh, the Masafa. And then uh, it also uh, suffices in place of the uh, and others upon whom it's not incumbent, such as women. Women don't have to pray Juma. If they want to go to Juma, they shouldn't be prevented from going to Juma. But it's not an obligation on them because of uh, children. It's just seen as a, you know, the the uh, menstruation, all the the things that prevent women from uh, leaving the houses, things like that. So it's 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 not in any way nux in her. Uh, you know, it's just a, it's a takhrib for the women. That's all it is. But if she wants to go, the Prophet ﷺ said, لا تمنعوا Ima Allah, Masajid Allah. Don't prevent the maid servants of God from going to the Masajid. If they want to go to the Masajid, the husbands are supposed to facilitate that for them, but they don't have to. In Maliki, in the Maliki jurisprudence, you need 12 male residents in order for there to be a Jum'ah. If there's not 12 male residents with the Imam, then the Jum'ah, you pray Zuhur instead. Uh, Abu Hanifa has three, right? And then Imam Shafi, I think, has 38. With the Imam, With the imam yeah. Uh, what's that? Huh? Mukallafin. They have to be Mukallafin, resident, male, uh, in order. I mean, it's what, what the minion, what the Jews call the minion, because they have the same ruling. Uh huh. I mean that's an opinion, you know. That I mean, there's people that do that. So, uh, in Maliki Madhab, it's not it's not a valid Juma, but it's valid in the other Madhabs. If you if if you know Sheikh Abdullah bin Bayya, who's he's a Maliki, but he's of the opinion in the West be really lenient on the Juma, just give people a lot of room because they're not living in a country that has the day off on Friday that there's a lot of problems that go with it. Because like in the, in the Hanbali Madhab, you can pray before Zawad, as long as the khutbah, the actual uh, sermon is after Zawad. So he said, just let people, if they, you know, if, if they need to make it at 12 o'clock for the lunch hour, and then the Imam should do it till like 12.30 when the Zawad comes in and then give the khutbah. Uh, yeah, I mean, sorry, the prayer, as long as the rakats are in uh, the... Uh, the after Zawal time. The khutbah can be before the Zawal. So, you know, that's his opinion. And, you know, I, I, I think people need to be facilitated to do that. If you're a physician, you know, and you have to, you're on call or you have to be near the hospital, then it could be, you know, uh, jeopardize your work like that.
and then you can if you know I don't I don't really like to say this because Juma is min sha'air but there is a valid opinion that the Juma is not even valid in uh, you know non non Muslim countries yeah so in fact there's an opinion that the Juma is not even valid anymore in Muslim countries which is why in Syria the ulama a lot of the ulama pray dhuhr after Juma. Who's been to Syria and seen that? Have you seen that? Yeah, they pray dhuhr. Everybody. Everybody. And that's because they're fuqaha. You know, so they pray the Juma and then they pray the dhuhr ihtiyatan. So, you know, because you need a, a you know, Juma is really a, a function of, uh, of the Imam. And if you don't have an Imam to sanction that, the, 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 the Iranians didn't pray Juma until Khomeini. They prayed Dhuhr. There was no Juma in Iran until Khomeini came back after they toppled the Shah. So, you know, those, but uh, there's no doubt, there's a hadith in the Muwatta that whoever leaves three Jumu'ah without valid reason gets a seal on their heart. So congregation prayer is an important, it's from the Sha'air, and it's, it's an important uh, thing to maintain in our community. That's why I wouldn't say that. But if, if you do have difficulties in your job or something like that, you know, you just do what you have to do. And, and there are, there's leniency, it's not like a rigid thing. All right, and then a lot of Jumas here are invalid anyway, just by because the imams don't know what they're doing. I'm, I mean, that's just a fact. There's a there's a lot of uh, if you if you ask them what are the obligations of Juma, a lot of these people that are leading the prayers uh, couldn't tell you. You know, I mean, I've gone to khutbas where the it's all the, the, they're mispronouncing all the hadiths, all the ayahs are, you know, the, the rafa and the nasab and the jar, it's all over the place. Like Imam Zaid said, the man who gave the khutbah, you know, ظهر الفساد في البر والبحر, you know, and, and then the man got up and he said, وعلى المنبر. <laughs> That's an Arabic joke. Yeah. Because it's al fil fil barri wal bahri, it should be majroor. But he made it. He put it in the the uh, nominative case. It should have been the uh, genitive case. So the guy said, "Wa al minbaru," you know, like the corruption is also on the minbar. Because the verse says, you know, there's corruption on the sea and on the land. <laughs> so he said, and on the minbar as well. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so you know it's it's a problem so generally it's good to do the Juma prayer I mean I think ihtiyatan pray the Juma with the niyyah and then do a dhuhr prayer is a good thing to do uh, anyway uh huh This is a musalla, where it's a temporary musalla. It's not a masjid. It's a temporary musalla. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Wherever you, as long as it's a clean place, you can do it in your room. You know, wherever you are, as long as it's a clean place. Obviously, the more people in the jama'ah, with Malik, you get a jama'ah. There's an opinion with your wife, you know, or husband that, that that's a jama'ah, but generally it's three. You know, if you, if you have three people, you get the reward of the praying in the jama'ah. So, but the masjid has an extra. Mm -hmm. Can women? You know, in, in this, that's a, a, a Shafi'i position. And there's definitely strong hadith for that. Malik didn't have it. It wasn't something he found people in Medina doing. He considered those hadiths to be khasa'is. You know, there's certain things the Prophet allowed certain people to do that didn't have a universal applicability. But there's one Imam, Ibn Ayman, in the Maliki Madhab, who, who considered it valid. Like, women could lead the women in prayer. If they do lead the women in prayer, they don't lead out front. They lead, 
yeah, in the same front line with the women. I mean, I tend to incline, I mean, I like that position, you know, personally. Um, uh, and I also, um, I like the Chinese practice, which is to have masjids for women. I think that's a really neat cultural practice of, of uh, the Chinese Muslim. Because the Chinese have massage just for women, women's only. I mean, it's interesting here, you know, they say separate but not equal is uh, unconstitutional. That You know, the Jim Crow laws were considered unconstitutional. And, you know, the, the only place that we have now segregation is in toilets, which is changing in the universities now because now they're actually starting to have shared uh, bathrooms between male and female. That's what I heard anyway. I mean, it was kind of a shock for me to hear that. But, it, you know, the idea is that there are certain things that you want privacy. Uh, you want your private space. And, and the polarity, the dynamic of men and women is such that w there's always the potential for attraction and for, I mean, it's, it's a cliched motif in Hollywood films to have the church scene where the two young people are like looking at each other while the minister is giving the sermon. I mean, that's like a cliche in, in untold numbers of films. But it's not a cliche for no reason, right? Because I remember being in church, right, when I was a teenager. <laughs> and, and, and so there is a reality to, you know, just to, to uh, helping people to get their intentions right. It's one of the reasons why, uh, and it's actually a testimony to the higher spirituality of women that men don't have women praying in front of them, you know, whereas the women can have the men praying in front of them. You know, it's, it's really a testimony. And, and there's a reality to the fact that women are not as attracted to physical form as men are. I mean, this, this has been done, this is social science, that, that uh, a physical form... I mean, you know, Stanford did studies where they would show naked pictures to men and they would become aroused by them and then they would show naked pictures to women and they would laugh. You know, it was, <laughs> you know, it was just a very different response. So, you know, because women need much more emotional content in, 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 uh, in intimacy than, than men. I mean, it's a weakness in men. So that you know, that idea of having separate space is very much, you know, it's the Jewish and the Islamic uh, position. The Christians, obviously, in early Christianity, it was more like that. But, you know, as Christianity developed, um, it changed. But they really did used to have uh, separate, you know, they had separate areas for the men and the women. Um, that's, you know, that's obviously no longer the case. Um, but that's, that's... Uh, you know, that's the, um, so I do like that, you know, personally. I like that idea, and I like the Chinese model of having, you know, in Baghdad, they used to have these uh, ribats for divorced women, where they could go into khalwa, and they would actually do their, uh, their idda period in a spiritual state. Because one of the things about divorce is, uh, you know, for women in particular, they're much more devastated by divorce than men. Although there are men that can be heavily devastated by divorce, but men tend to, you know, um, you know t tend to handle it better than women. But that opens up a spiritual, you know, uh, opening for a woman. It's like, you know, when I worked in uh, critical care, because I was in a cardiac unit, you know, it's always amazing to see these people right after heart attacks. And, and you'd see this gap. It usually lasted for about three days where they were really reflecting and thinking about death and, and I, I need to reassess my life and I need to get my priorities right. And, but then they start feeling better. The doctor would say, you're looking great. You know, it was just you know, put you on this, that, or the other and you'll be feeling fine, fit as a fiddle. And you would just see the change, and they just go back and start making their plans. And, <laughs> and so those are like spiritual windows that people have in their lives. When, when you know, a sudden death, your parents die, uh, you get these spiritual windows, and, it, and, the, and the heart opens up to it, and then it closes back again. And divorce is one of those times. And, and you, you can go the kind of resentful, angry route, which is one way, and a lot of people choose to go that way. 
but it's also a time just to realize one you know that women don't need men to be completed you know women are not completed by men men already know that generally but women that that's something that is has to be learned over uh, over time that that uh, there's there's a complementary relationship between men and women but the the a woman is complete unto herself she does not need a man to be complete and maryam is the great example of that that's why she's such an exemplar in the quran because mary is the woman who doesn't need men to be impregnated and she doesn't need men for her provision god gave her both those things and one of the meanings of a ma- maryam in hebrew is a woman worth two men you know i mean the, the, because that's essentially what a man gives a woman provision and and pregnancy but god gave maryam both those things without uh, a man so she's she's got the uh close to <laughs> She's got the, uh, you know, that spiritual advantage of not needing uh, the man. So that opening is an incredible opening for women, and it would be good for us to develop those things in this culture. I think, you know, to have retreat places for women, um, so that they can develop within their own spiritual context, because they have a different spirituality than men do, and uh, and the Prophet Sallallahu definitely addressed that aspect. Um, Yeah. So, um, and then the Sunan of Jumu'ah is to perform ghusl just before leaving. It's better to do it right before you go to the masjid. If you do it in the morning, if you're working, that's fine. But the Sunan is to do it right before you go to the masjid. It's recommended to leave for it at the time of the midday heat, before the, the zenith. When, when, when it's starting to get really hot, the you know, it's like about 11.30. And then go before the actual zawal, go into the masjid and do some, uh, like read Surah Kahf, do something. And then to go in an elegant manner, which means, according to Qad Iyad, cutting the nails, shaving the pubic hair, removing the armpit hair, um, and then uh, wearing the best clothes, preferably white, and applying the best perfume and cleaning one's teeth. Um, unfortunately, you know, in the old days, and like I saw Morocco when it's still Juma was a real serious thing because the older people in Morocco always wore their best clothes it was a beautiful thing to see Juma uh, that's all changed which is a bad sign as far as I uh, I'm concerned you know in 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 the West you, you call it your Sunday best you know the, the it used to be people actually had clothes they that they saved just for Sunday and it was their best suit because the idea you're going to God's house and, and you, you, know, you give God your best. Now you see people in t-shirts and jeans. You know, they look like they haven't taken a bath in a couple of days and, you know, yellow teeth. It, it's, it's not a good sign. I mean, these are all, the Prophet was teaching people, um, yeah, excellence in their, you know, and he was very concerned about hygiene. Prophet had, uh, he, he could not stand bad smells. I mean, he said, whoever eats uh, onions and, and, uh, uh, and uh, garlic, stay away from our, our masajid. You know, just don't come. Right, so Ramadan, you know, Allahu Akbar, you've got an incredible qari, you're in this thing, and then somebody belches next to you in this whiff of, you know, whatever they ate, you know, garlic and onions, and I mean, it's just, you know, those, those type things are, are uh, and the Prophet didn't like even belching, you know, he said to a man uh, who belched, he said, you know, Kuf anka jashak, you know, don't, you know, don't belch in, in our company, you know, it's just, those type things are all about civility and adab and comportment, and, you know, the Prophet he just had so much adab in everything that he did. You know, he was more modest than a virgin uh, in her cloister before she came out. You know, like, uh, he, he had incredible modesty. Things, things, things in his gathering were always uh, done in the best of taste. And, and he, I, 
despite that, I mean, he had a wonderful sense of humor, and he was certainly uh, in no way a prude. I mean, the Prophet is so far from a prude. Anybody that reads, you know, uh, the seerah and, and some of these amazing stories, and he was not prudish at all. He was, he was very, uh, he recognized human nature, human uh, foibles, um, and, uh, and he laughed at the appropriate times. He never laughed inappropriately, but at appropriate times he laughed, and he, and, uh, and he told jokes, and he appreciated a good joke. I mean, his sahaba used to tell jokes, and he would laugh with them. So, and Nu'iman, who was like a court jester, used to make him laugh. You know, and he was a character. I mean, he used to send him, uh, you know, he used to send him gifts. Like he'd send him, you know, food or perfume. And, 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 and then he'd send the guy that he bought it from to the Prophet to pay for it. <laughs> so the man would show up, he'd say, who are you? He said, no, Iman bought some perfume from me. When I asked him for the money, he told me to get it from you. So, so he'd give the Prophet the gift, but then he'd charge him for it. Yeah. <laughs> and the Prophet loved him, you know. I mean, in the riwayah, I mean, they're, they're of the opinion that he was the man who was punished for drinking alcohol when he was punished. And people forget that the Prophet saw I sent him, you know, they did not have harsh punish Like they used to, uh, you know, it was like a public shame thing. Like we used to have uh, blocks in America, you know. You had block. You put people in blocks, you know. You have this... Because they would, it was public shaming, you know, just <laughs> so so it would, you know keep public order. But that's that in a sense is what they were doing. Like the Prophet Sallallahu when when people were punished, it was usually with a, a palm fiber. It wasn't hard, uh, and uh, you know, but but he he was punished for drinking, and and it had been more than one time, and and somebody was there seeing it, and he said, Allahumma anhu, you know, God damn him. Uh, and the Prophet said, don't damn him because the only thing I know about that man is he loves God and his messenger. And that's in Al-Bukhari. Uh, and Ibn Hajar says that that is the most hopeful hadith for the people of major sins. Because even though the man was a reprobate, uh, the Prophet did not deny his love for God and for the messenger. So. So a congregation, 13 people is needed, which is 12 in the imam. For other obligatory prayers, it is a confirmed sunnah. The reward of praying in a congregation is realized with only one rakah or any portion thereof performed behind the imam. And so now uh, the recommended acts in the prayer in congregation, it is recommended for an individual to repeat a prayer that he has performed alone should he find a congregation performing it. Except for maghrib, as well as Isha, if you perform with her. So if you prayed on your own, Dhuhr, and then you find a group praying Dhuhr, it's recommended that you pray the... You can't lead the prayer, because you've already performed your fard. So you should not lead the prayer. But, but if you find a congregational prayer, then you should pray it. Um, you should pray it uh, again if... You, if uh, you don't have to again. It's just mandub. It's mandub, so it's a good thing. Uh, you know, it's makru in, in Ma'ach. You, you can do it. It's makru to do it. Because um, nafid is more a private thing. Even in Malik's madhab, tarawih is better in your house. Yeah. Than in the, in the masjid. It's better to pray it in your house. Unless you're lazy and you end up not doing it. But if you actually can do it, it's better to pray in your house than it is in the masjid with the... Uh, you know, there's a lot of things Muslims do that are very interesting. Like one of the things that I find amazing is in in Mecca the tarawih is huge. I mean tarawih in Mecca is just unbelievable. But tawaf is better than tarawih, and that's the best time to make tawaf because nobody's making tawaf. They're all praying tarawih, even though tawaf is better than tarawih. Isn't that amazing? This is really interesting. There's a lot of things like that Muslims do where they, they just get it completely backwards. Mm -hmm. Mm 
Oh, yeah. You need to do qada. We're going to get to qada because it's an important bab, and some people do have prayers that they, that they need to make up. But the, 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 in Maliki, your niyyah has to be the same as the imams. Like in Shafi'i, they don't. So if you're making up a prayer that's different from the imam's niyyah, it's, it's invalid if you're doing praying behind him. So for instance, he's praying dhuhr, but you're doing a makeup of dhuhr from two days ago. It's not, it's not valid. Because he's doing that dhuhr, whereas he's doing ada, and you're doing qada. So there's farq fin niya. Together? That, I mean, that's valid. Yeah. Yeah. Mm hmm. No, you can pray with your family, you can pray with, yeah. But, but it's better to pray, the nafida is always better between you and God. Because, you know, the hadlun nafs is that. See, the thing about fard, there's no riya in fard. Now there might be, but there shouldn't be. Because everybody has to pray fard. So you're not doing anything extra. You're doing what you're obliged to be doing. But when you're doing nafida, you're doing extra. So there's always the fear of the ostentation, the spiritual pride, the showing off coming in. And so generally, you know, the sharia develops these things. It's always better not to tell people you're fasting. You know, it's better uh, when you're doing extra things. If it's Ramadan, everybody's fasting. It's no big deal. But if you're doing nafida, you know, it's like the man who's praying and really long prayer and uh, you know and two men are talking he said subhanallah that man's so amazing you know he's here every day he does all these extra prayers and you know the man turns around and he said and you didn't mention I was fasting too you know <laughs> so I'm very nice I'm very nice. All right. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, you can. Some, some, some of the ulama say it's makru to do that. I, I definitely wouldn't encourage it for the imam because you, you're, you're, you're discouraging the hell. You know. So, so the, the, and that's one of the khasais of our ummah is memorization. I mean, this ummah, you know, most, mo very few people in other religions know their scripture. I mean, Imam al-Qurtabi, in his tafsir, inna nahnu nazalna dhikra wa inna lahu lahafidun, in that verse, he mentions that in Andalusia, because he was living in Qurtaba, he mentions that one of the uh, uh, Christians, who was a calligrapher, master calligrapher, he did a, a Torah, but he put mistakes in it. And he took it to the Jew, like the best rabbi in Qurtaba. And uh, he asked him to read it and tell him what he thought. And he read the whole thing. He said, did you read the whole thing? He said, yes. He said, what do you think? He said, it's a beautiful edition of the Torah. He said, are you sure? He said, absolutely. He said, would you use it in your congregation? He said, yes. And then he did uh, an edition of the Gospel and he put mistakes in it on purpose and then he took it to the leader of the Christians and same thing and he told him beautiful addition calligraphy is excellent you know and, and uh, he said that you, so you would use this and you're he said absolutely and then he did he did a Quran and he took it to the Imam in Qurtaba Imam al Qurtubi mentions this in his tafsir so then he took it to the Imam and he said could you read this and tell me what you think so he read it all the way through. He said it needs to be burnt. And he said, why? He said there are several mistakes in it. And so he said that he knew that, that, that the Quran had been preserved. But it wasn't preserved by the writing. It was preserved by the memory. Like our reliance is not on the Mus'haf. It's on the Hevel of the masters. of the. I mean, I'll give you an example. I had a handwritten copy of Sahih al-Bukhari from the Dila'i uh, Zawiyah in Morocco. It's about 400 years old. Beautiful edition. 
Um, I tell this story with pain. But uh, a really beautiful edition, gold uh, ink. And, and I had a half uh, over who knows all nine collections by rote. I mean, just all nine with the isnad. And I, and I showed them this edition. He was, he was looking at it. He said, there's a mistake in that hadith. And, and, I, and I, he said, it's missing the min. You know, there should be a min there. And uh, it is amazing. So that's, that's the, you know, the, the hevel is like, so, it, you know, if you're doing it privately, yeah, but I wouldn't encourage that in the masajid. You know, people should either get a hafiz. And also, it's not necessary that you read the whole Quran in tarawih. Uh, that, that's something that was, you know, it's not necessary. I mean, just, you know, people can read whatever they want from the. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, it's good to do khatam in Ramadan, but it's not necessary to do it in. The tarawih is valid. The khatam is not a shart or a condition of the tarawih. What's that? I mean, I would get like a, because you, if you have too much movement, it invalidates your prayer. And that, that can be too much movement, you know. So, uh, but I, you can get a stand. You know, they have stands, like a, a stand. You can get a stand and read from the Quran like that if you want. That turn... Well, now Twitter or whatever they call those things, you know, you, they're going to have those, I'm sure, with the Quran pretty soon. I have, yeah. But the, uh, you know, they'll have the, I'm mean, pretty soon they'll just have a hilf chip they'll put in your head. So. <laughs> was, he, was he asking about the turning of the pages? Yeah. Because they have spiral, I mean, really, it's a big spiral. Um, yeah. Turn the page, yeah. It's a big, so even if the stand is kind of hard, it's yeah. easier to do. Mashallah. Uh huh. On that page, there was a monthly tour. I mean, that was only for Medina. The tawaf. They had tawaf after every two rakats, they would make tawaf. But Ibn Abi Zayd says that you can do that. You know, it's in the... Uh, go ahead, sorry. I was just thinking about... No, 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 go ahead. I was just thinking about that. If you know that if you move a little bit, then uh, you'll have to have sadness, and people can go without... Yeah, you can move slightly in the prayer. If you need to move to avoid, like even to avoid a insect or something like that, you, you can move in the prayer. It just shouldn't be more than three prayer. Uh, you know. Even if you come into the prayer and they're in ruku'ah, you can go into ruku'ah and then move like that. You know, to catch the ruku'ah, you can do that. Uh huh. Yeah. You you clap. Yeah. Yeah. No, you clap. Mm -hmm. What's that? The, you know, the Sunnah of the Malikis is from Omar ibn al Khattab, which is to do 20 and then do 2 and 3. Um, you know, if you're praying in your house, if you do 8 or 10, that, you know, how, however many you want. But the Sunnah is 20. And they were short. I mean, that's why Imam. You know, when you do eight, if you're doing the, the juz every night, they're long uh, rakat. So the idea was to, to actually help people, you know, give them that rest space. I mean, hadar, you know, like a hadar qira'a is, you know, not so there's ikhlal of tajweed, but, you know, tadweer or hadar, you know, is, 
I, if you do tajweed, you're going to be... You couldn't do it, you know? Especially with love. You'll be there. Yeah. In Malik, you don't do it. If the Imam started his khutbah, you come and you sit down. Uh, there's no tahiyyat al masjid. You only do tahiyyat if you come in before the Imams come out. Yeah. Mm -hmm. In the, in, the, in the Maliki, the witr prayer, shafa and witr, is done two rakats, salamu alaykum, and then the, the witr prayer is one rakat, salamu alaykum. There's no qunut, like the Hanafi. It, uh, the fajr is, you can do witr all the way up to fajr. If it's your want to, you know, and you, you wake up late and you didn't pray, because some people, you know, Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu prayed with her after Isha. And Abu Huraira delayed it till before Fajr. So, you know, it just depends on, on what, uh, what you do as a practice. If you get up generally before Fajr, uh, which some people do, and, and, and you do a few rakats or you do eight rakats or how many, tahajjud. If you're doing night prayers then, and, and you're consistent on it, then you, uh, you should pray with her then when you do that because it's the last prayer. If, however, you're not consistent or you, you, you know, you, you're worried about oversleeping, then you should do with her after you do the sunnah of, of Isha or do it just as your last, after Isha, shafa and with her. Either way. The qunut is only done at fajr. It's in the subah prayer. After the second rakat, before you go into Rukuwa. Uh -huh. You don't do with that again. You only do it once. So you just do your, you end with your uh, two rakats of your tahajjud. Yeah, no, you go, if you're going to do Sunni, you do them at home. Or if you're not going to go home and you want to pray, then you should just at least wait till people leave or go to the corner, the, the side opposite the exit of the thing. But in, it's makru to do it, you know. What do you mean? Before, uh -huh. no, you don't do those. They're not made up. They're just not. Uh -huh. They're nafila. You don't make up. The only prayers you make up are fard prayers, and then the witr prayer, the shafa and witr prayer, right? Then, then you make up that. But other than that, you don't. Mm -hmm. In Maliki, it's supposed to be in Arabic, so it should not be in. It should be Arabic. The way that in Algeria, one of the places I studied in. <coughs> The Imams used to do a a, a, a talk before Jama'ah in Ammiyah because most of the people couldn't understand Fusha. So they would do a talk in Ammiyah before the Jama'ah and then they would do a very short khutbah, which is what I do. I do a talk in English before the, uh, the, uh, the Jama'ah and then do a short Arabic khutbah. Um, you know. But Abu Hanifa was of the opinion that the purpose of the sermon is to do wa'al for the people and it should be done in the language of the people, which makes sense. It's interesting, you know, there's the rulings, you can see how some of the rulings are to encourage people learning Arabic and there's no doubt that the early people all learned Arabic. That's why wherever the Muslims went for that first hundred years, they're Arab countries almost. Right? I mean, if you look, just look at the geographical... Persia used to be almost entirely Arabic speaking. They were bilingual, like the Berbers in Morocco. You know, the Berbers all speak Arabic and they speak their native tongue. So wherever the Muslims went early, they tended to create a bilingual uh, culture because people learned Quran. Now, Quran was basic literacy. So everybody learned Quran. So it's good to learn the sacred language of the religion. 
and, 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 and so Imam Shafi'i in, in the early madhab prohibited transactions in other than Arabic. And his argument is, is an interesting argument. He said in any transaction, if you have people that speak different languages, you're going to use one language. So why, he said, are you uh, uh, abandoning Arabic to go to their language? You, you know, if they want the deal, then they, <laughs> they should be doing it in Arabic. So he actually, and that just, you know, it's like now all transactions are done in English because the British were so good at, you know, imposing their language on the world. The French are still upset about it because they used to call, you know, the lingua franca, <laughs> right, in English, that means the spoken language of a lot of people. It used to be French. Yeah, so you do hamd, you do one ayah, you do some sort of wow in there. I'm going to do the shuruq part of it. It's the next chapter. Mm-hmm. There's no sunnah mu'akkada before Jama'ah. There's nafila. Tahiyyat al masjid. Two. There's nafila. If you're talking about the nafila, it's four. As long as he hasn't started his khutbah. Once he starts his khutbah, then, you know, إِذَا قُرِيَ الْقُرَانَ فَاسْتَمِعُوا لَهُ وَأَنْصِتُوا You know, once the Qur'an is, is... Because he's going to be reciting verses and you're, you're supposed to listen attentively to the verses. You shouldn't talk when the Qur'an's being recited. And the Prophet ﷺ said, whoever even... مَنْ لَغَى فَلَا صَرَاتَ لَهُ You know, if, if you say anything, you know, it's... It's, it's, uh, it's like you don't... You, you've lost your prayer. Even though the Jummah is valid, but... It's as if, you know. All right. And then.